Okay, this one is the uh, Nomad Bicycle Camper on the end. Made this about a couple of years ago. So the floor is um, two sheets of Coroplast screwed down about every three inches. So it's kind of like a hammock. And then I use the little bubble wrap stuff here to, to insulate it. So on this, I've got speakers here. I have a little MP3 player that plugs in here. That's fun. <laughs> Windows. You know, just peepholes. Oh, this one you have a stove too, right? Now, yeah, it's a propane stove. Are you worried stove. about safety on the stove? No. You sit there, it flares up, you bail out. All these are prototypes, yeah. one-offs. Yeah. Sometimes they'll go crazy on them, and other times they'll just, eh, not so crazy. Uh. Woo! Whoa! <laughs> See, this is what I don't like about this particular design. You know, the axles are right here, so if I do this, but I wanted room for the stove and a sink. So if I were to do it again, I'd move the wheels up, probably have the stove outside. Always room for improvement. Always room for improvement, yep. <laughs> I had to actually sleep in this a couple nights uh, while we were doing some flooring in the house. And then I slept in this one for about a week. These two here are attempts at creating a cheap uh, overflow shelters for um, homeless folks. Like if they're going to go at a, uh, a place to stay overnight, if it's cold in the winter and they're full, which sometimes they are. This was kind of the attempt to see if you can make something for about a hundred bucks. This one had the pallet floor, took a table saw to cut the boards, and it was pretty time consuming to make. A lot of people I think are struggling what to do with their hands. I think it's an innate part of our nature to want to build something, yet Modern society just wants you to go out and buy their stuff. Buy, buy, buy. I secured a uh, two by three to the bottom of the base as a stop guide for the coroplast sheets. In making, I think you get a lot more. I went ahead and cut out my two uh, OSB end caps. There is some satisfaction in that, I think. This is my first structure with coroplast. So yeah, this is a bicycle camper, has a tow bar. I spent a year building this one, so I threw everything in there. So yeah, this one has the sink, the stove was here 10 years ago. I had too much time on my hands, obviously. <laughs> so I kind of did this post-apocalyptic, fun little goofy thing, Mad Max camper. Designer of the mini bagel. So yeah, this thing goes down for sleeping. Pull these little guys here, and it drops the floor. This is what I think a lot of people want to do. They want to build maybe a little shelter, and then that lifts up too for uh, cross ventilation. Yeah, library. This is where you slept. You put your head out here. For now, if, if you want to build a house, no way. Solar panel, shower. You know, it fill worked, it. fill it. Yeah, and it was plumbed in here to the sink. That worked at one time. What is that? Windmill. It's got a bicycle generator on there. Oh. So it worked to power lights. Mary and I were looking into the building the house and I went down to the courthouse to look at the rules and regs and huge stack of do's and don'ts, mostly don'ts. This one locks. <laughs> Got a string underneath. Let's see if I can find it. So this is where I think a lot of people are fascinated with small sheds turning them into little houses. With me, I go ultra micro. It's just my thing, it's just my thing. So this was made out of uh, two pallets, 48 by 40 inch pallets. So it's 40 inches wide, eight feet long, and uses up the whole two sheets. And affordable? Well, let's see. One, two sheets I was able to get for $30, free for the, the pallet, and uh, about a $20 sheet of OSB. So it was under $70 or so. Little vent lights. Not enough ventilation, I discovered. Um, this was prototype one. 
So you're just constantly prototyping. Yeah, here's the latch. You can see the string. So that goes down here <laughs> and down where you saw me pull the string. Comes through the floor here. You know, nobody knows but the people you tell. So you want to be able to safeguard their night stay. Ooh, it's warm in there. I want to be able to manufacture them a little faster. It was kind of nice that I was able to use recycled wood, but it wasn't too much money to buy a few two by fours and another sheet of OSB. And that way I was able to make this one collapsible. This is a uh, collapsed and delivered to somebody. This is how you put it together. Screw one side down, finding the old holes, rolling it over, and then attaching the uh, panel to the other side. Now a person could use piano hinges to uh, secure the two side walls. That'd be handy. But here, being a prototype, I just uh, did it this way. Sorry, it's a mess in there, but... <laughs> It's double insulated, it has two sheets. So I wanted a little desk, little place to put their stuff, shoes, the backpack, flowers, <laughs> and just a cozy place to be. You got your light. Then here you have a smoke and carbon monoxide detector. I made the vents a little bigger on this. This guy right here, it's okay. about a four by eight, and then I have another four by eight right there. So there's a little cross ventilation. This I was experimenting with a light bulb, 150 watt light bulb to heat the can, you know, and maybe get a little heat in there. And uh, I didn't have to open the door during the night. Didn't have too much condensation either. So I really like this one. Night. It's really downpouring outside. Kind of noisy in here, but at least I'm dry. <laughs> I didn't get much sleep last night. Uh, it was like sleeping with my head inside of a drum. Condensation, still in here, not too bad on the walls. Mm, sleeping bag's dry. Didn't have to crack the door open, so I think I got the ventilation good. Felt like there was good airflow going. And it's still about 10 degrees warmer in here than the outside, but it can be warmer, especially when it gets down to colder temperatures. Yeah, and then here, this was kind of a, just a place to sit and hang out. I had a little stove here and, you know, it doesn't have to be for homeless. You can camp here and cook. You know me. <laughs> Gotta think of everything. But often the same shape. Yeah, you'll see the arcs because arc is a natural strong shape, you know. So there's no framing needed in these. It's just the end walls that hold everything up. You know, pretty darn sturdy. I've had six inches of snow on this, no problem. That's kind of why I go with that. This moves as well, it's a push cart. It has old bicycle wheels, some one by twos. It was under $60. Sometimes I don't play with so much use of the shelter, but how few sheets I can make a shelter with. This is a two sheet shelter. And it's a little funky because it's been out for many a year. So I was using this to draw in. I could take it to a field if it's raining or whatever and do my sketching. I'd sit in here too and put a bird feeder on top and let the birds jump around. And watch their shadow on the roof. I used to work in the interiors building at Boeing, and there's where they make the airplane bathrooms. And if you know in the bathrooms, it's a pretty small space, yet they got a lot of stuff going on there. So it's cool to just go in there and actually see how it's built. And I'm taking some of those thoughts to some of these uh, concepts that I'm making, just utilizing the space to its ultimate. Yeah, party stores, you get these for 10 bucks, whatever each. They're just fun. This comes up, kind of like a drawing table here. This stove, you draw the air in from the outside and then you vent it outside. So it's not taking any of the air. Tight fits. I mean, everything's just... It's two feet wide. <laughs> but again, like I said, I was just playing with what can two sheets afford for a shelter? This really wouldn't be grand for a, a push cart for a homeless person. It's not a lot of storage space unless you put storage on 
this area here, a little basket or something for exterior stuff. But this is all you really have for storage if you're going to recline. You can also sleep in it too. Yeah, it's six feet long. <laughs> oh, no. oh, it's been sitting out four years. This is what I want to know. Are they going to hold up after four years? Right? I guess so. No, I'm, I'm glad when things break. It's like, okay, I guess I won't make a plan on that and really? say this is going to last 10 years. <laughs> so what would you do instead? Ah, look for something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite boat. Huh. No, it's just, oh, you just pick it up with one hand? Yeah. Pretty light. So the idea is you just kind of put it on your shoulder, or how do you carry it? You know, I was thinking about that this morning of maybe making this into a wheelbarrow, uh -huh. putting a wheel that will flip down and have some shoulder straps up here so you just push it down the trail with all your gear in the back. Something I'll probably work on here in the future. I was hoping it would fold up, but I don't want to compromise the integrity of the hull. You saw the yellow kayak, right? This is the one that um, folds up into yeah, a boat. Yeah, foldable. That you, yeah. yeah, one sheet. It's a whole thing right there. <laughs> That's it. Need a boat? Here you go, right here. <laughs> Oars and everything. It's about 15 zip ties to put it together. They're uh, self-releasing, so it's not a one-time use zip tie. Making something, you get a lot more satisfaction out of the item once it's done. Well, that's the joy that I have in doing what I do. I started playing around with this little guy. This goes in the transom end, pivots like this, and you use your feet, right, to generate the fin. This is an idea I had years ago. It's a fin propulsion boat. And I wanted something lightweight, something that wouldn't pollute the atmosphere, something I could go fishing with, control, hands-free. This is taken from a boat called the Thistle. Except I used PVC. I'm trying to make it a DIY project. $15 for the hardware, the PVC, and the nuts and bolts. A couple hours of time assembling it. So it worked okay, and that's why I made this boat. Then I added a little motor. This one here? Yes. Looks like a handmade boat. It is, it is. Second launch. Probably the most satisfaction I've ever had was making my first boat. It was just two big wide boards and a sheet of plywood cut down the center, bunch of nails and glue, and all that was on the water. And it was like, wow, 100 bucks, and I made this thing. So this boat's called Liberty. It's made with quarter-inch green plywood. It has five layers. At least one by 12 in size. And I was able to add wheels so I could cart it like a wheelbarrow. I was banging on sails and dagger boards and put an electric motor on it. And you just can't go out and buy anything like that. So we're just creeping right along, but I'm having a good time. So I know not everybody's like me who can, you know, go to that degree, but it does give you that ability to play. Just grabbing a hammer, a saw, nails, and just experimenting. You're gonna fail. Maybe the thing's gonna sink. Make sure you do it in shallow water before you, you know, go to the deep end. <laughs> I flipped my boats before. I've had some not too good successes, but in the end, you figure out what needs to, to work to get it to float.
This steering is very simple. It's reminiscent of my first tiller steering that I had on my Liberty boat. This is just a old-fashioned faucet knob I found at a thrift shop for five bucks. Just experimenting. You get a lot more satisfaction than going out and buying a cheap plastic kayak. This is four millimeter plastic. I fortified the uh, hole with some one by two boards. So I've been looking out my window and I've been noticing that the harbor porpoises are out there. <sighs> is that cool or what? I try to keep things, the, the KISS principle, where you keep it simple, stupid. I don't try to over-engineer anything. This is a little, huh? a little glove box. And this is also a tray to where you eat your food. So like this, it's an origami, it's a Chinese to-go box. Food to-go box, basically. Well, think about it. When you go to Chinese food here in America, they give you the little box. You put your food in there. and. You look at it and go, oh, it's just paper. How is that? Well, it's the way they fold it. It's the same here. It's just the way I fold it keeps all the moisture out. This is it flat, right? And the folds bring it like so. Then you bolt these together and you have a transom. So there's actually no tape, no glue holding this together, just a few bolts. Pretty simple. So it came from looking at something completely different, a um, Chinese to-go box. No, right. this, no. Guy, <laughs> this guy here gave me the full inspiration, found him on the internet. He won a cardboard boat race with this thing. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, I kind of dissected what he did and went from there. That was my inspiration for all my Coroplast boats. So when you spot something that you think is interesting, no matter whether people think it's interesting or not, you just recognize it. and. I see potential, and this is kind of where I've exercised my brain throughout my whole lifetime. Was, I'm also an artist. I did the wire art thing there. You know, I do art. Well, to me, what I'm creating here, the boats, the shelters, I like the aesthetic look of them. So it's kind of not just function, but aesthetics. The most popular boat I made was Little Miss Sally, and that's kind of a dory, eight-foot wooden boat but it just had these cool lines and it works great and it looks cool. I sell plans, I try not to ask much, but I'm hoping the people will not build exactly what I made, but take it as an idea and then go from there, add their own little flavor. Andrew came out from New Jersey all the way just to take his maiden voyage with me here in Lake Union. I really like coming out here with people who built their own versions of the electric boat that I've got. No, this was actually inspired by Paul Elkins. That's, that's me, by the way, folks. <laughs> that's, that's him right there on the camera. And, you know, I laughed. I, I laughed in, excited, in excitement when I first saw it. I wanted to have the same fun. Then, of course, a lot of people told me not to build it the way I was building it. I think you just need to push forward in your own conviction and what you're doing. This is my gas here. This is my shifter. I have five speed cluster in the back. I can hold quite a bit of groceries back there. This is where I start the motor. Just pull this guy. My turn signal here. I can just open this door. What I'm doing a lot is reliving my past, the past that I missed out on. When I was young, I was really into soapbox derby. You can go to Ekron, Ohio if you won your local and state, you know, I always... 
So I have drawings and drawings when I was a little kid. Those were the first drawings I had was my soapbox derby. It was going to be real laid down, sleek, and I was going to win. And my dad went as far as making me, buying the wheels and the axle, making me the base. And then he worked at Boeing, and then work picked up. A lot of overtime I had to do, and we never completed it. Pavo turned out to be quite comfortable. Little guy's not that fast, but um, I'm not looking for fast, I'm looking for comfort. I think a lot of what I do here is maybe trying to relive that moment. Because there's simple things that I make. Kind of like a soapbox derby, right? I think my dad was sorry that he wasn't able to, to do that for me. But, but you put foot on the table. Outside. That's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to inspire people to, to do that. I go camp and this is how I get around. Little pedal car. I just kind of take it every year just to get some use out of it. So I made this with a trunk. Pull this latch down, lift it up, and there you go. This has been my biggest fascination for the longest time. A high mileage trike that will maybe get about 160, 180 miles per gallon. Possible, yeah. I think it's very possible. Yeah. Oh, sure. I've been following the IHPVA for a long time. They're an International Human Powered Vehicle Association. And there was a challenge of how fast humans could pedal a bike. They set this up in like 1978 or so. And they started putting fairings on bicycles. Uh, Figuring, uh, ah, it'll work. But then they started doing recumbents, and then they started getting sleeker and sleeker, and they were trying to get it to where if you could break 55 miles per hour. Somebody broke it, and years progressed, and they set it up higher and higher, 65. Now it's up to like 82 miles an hour, and that's just some guy pedaling. So it tells you with computer-generated modeling of aerodynamics, you can get a real teardrop shape. Add a little engine, that's the idea. So this I did years ago, about 17 years ago. It was my first attempt at a high mileage trike. Someone gave me a Honda 350. I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll just try that. But it wasn't the engine size I wanted. So it was a little overbuilt. I built it with ATV front end, took it to the DMV, and they said, what the hell is this? They said, in Washington State, you gotta have no off-road parts on a vehicle. It's on the road. So I had to change this out for an old Volkswagen VW Beetle front end, which made it too heavy, which strained the engine, and I just threw my hands in the air. I sold it, what, six months ago last year? Yeah, I've got hundreds of these trike drawings. Someday, someday. That's an early one, that's like from 1990. So this is kind of almost the concept of the uh, Velomobiles, but with a motor, yeah. Anyway, this is my little car. It can be as easy as just a little motor. It may only go maybe 35 miles an hour, but if you're putting around a city, that's all you need. If you had a city vehicle like this, it's pretty much almost a little go-kart with a body, but you've got your mirror, your lights, your little accoutrements, and it would be so simple to work on. If you could get it legalized, that's it. If it was a three-wheeler, they would classify it as a trike and with a motor and a da da yeah, it's okay. But yeah, it's very dangerous <laughs> going around a turn. If you got four wheels, much more safer, but they go, oh, no, 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 no. So our rules and regs, worldwide it seems, are messed up. They need to change. Because something like this could go 150 miles per gallon. Or it could be battery powered. Let's see what I got. There's a little... This is a miniature library. This is like a four by seven shed. I thought it'd be cool. Have you ever seen those mailbox libraries? So this was kind of that concept, but where you can actually get inside, sit down on an old sofa, and have all these books around you to read. So one, one person library <laughs> with a big window, and you just have it in your front yard, and uh, hopefully nobody will think of nefarious thoughts. 14 years ago, my daughter decided to come move with me. She turned 18. She'd been living with her mother in Colorado. I decided to take uh, the small section, it's 24 by 19, and turn it into a little apartment for her. There was kind of a bed up against here. 
Again, this is kind of, you're walking into the living room, right? Little propane stove. This floor came from an old barn silo about a mile away. This is uh, probably 100 plus year old, old growth wood. There's not a nut in it. My dad came over and we pulled these boards apart one by one. Silos are just long, 28, five foot high structures and that's how long these boards are. And they're tongue and groove. It's the best feature of the apartment. I took the scraps and made the counter. It's, it's not perfect. I could have probably put more filler in there to make this smooth. And then I had a lot of the old barnwood here. So I wanted to just kind of a theme. Nice. I'm a drywall finisher from way back. So I took my time on the drywall and wanted to accent it with the old barnwood. So one time this was really a sharp little place. Kitchen area, recycled sinks and this and that. It was pretty cheap to put together. Storage under here. Bathroom's a mess, but she lived here a year and then I consequently rented it out for seven years oh, to wow. a Vietnam vet. Wayne's a good guy, but he's a bachelor. Found these at the dump. This too. You found all this at the dump? Yeah. And then I use just copper piping to make the sink. Obviously it corrodes pretty easily if you oh. don't take care of it. <laughs> so this is a roofing, just tin roofing. But yeah, I love the copper work going all the way up here. Me too. Got the little rubber uh, gaskets on the roofing now Great. there. Worked out pretty good. So I never did finish the ceiling. No. Uh, ah. I'm hoping to before we put this up for sale. Yeah. So you can go much bigger. This is yeah. the biggest apartment I've ever made. Mm -hmm. Big structure. When I was a youngster, about 19 years old, I did a lot of bumming around the country. Sometimes I was too proud to ask for money from my parents when I wasn't working. And there's a few times I was homeless. A couple days too where I didn't have anything to eat. It's kind of a frightening experience. It's the kind of thing that sticks with you all your life. At least it has with me. Even though I've been working since 1988. So every now and again I play around with homeless shelter ideas. This is just a steak I've got. Whittled a little dowel on the top. Take the shoes, put them on the sides. Keep that opening there so you can breathe in here. It's kind of nice. It's fairly easy to get out of. This way you don't have any rope to deal with. Again, this is something that a person could put on in the winter time to walk around in. And, uh, in the city or wherever. So anyway, here I am playing around again. I get a lot of people contacting me saying, A, you saved my life. I'm about ready to go homeless. And now I built a camper and I have a home. Yeah. Quite a few times I've gotten. And that's it. I, you, don't need, you don't need much space to have everything you need. And you can tow it with your bike. don't need gas. You don't need all the normal stuff, insurance. So if you want to live on the cheap, even if it's just temporary, there you go. And you, you gotta slow down and smell the roses, so sure you're not zipping down the road real fast because you're towing a whole lot of weight with you, but that's okay. You got nothing better to do. So I don't know if you could see it, but 81 feet up there is a chair. <laughs> no. Hard to see. It's hanging right there. It's a goofy little thing like this. It's kind of like a bag. Yeah. It's been up there about four years. I haven't been up there in a long time. You climb up? Yeah, got to climb it up just like a regular tree. Climb up. Yeah, I have a platform up there too, but uh, I was going to put a little box and then my wife got wind of it and said, hell no. <laughs> There's one time I put my foot down with him. He wanted to put a, it's a three foot by three foot yeah. hot house. Like it was all plexiglass windows, three foot by three foot with a roof. Yeah. And he wanted to put it 80 feet up in that tree and then go sit in it and relax. And I thought, oh my God, he's gonna fall asleep in the heat and fall out. So I just said, no way, we're not doing that. And 
Probably a good call, too. Good to see you, Mom. <laughs> so instead, he treat. put a lawn chair, and then he put a radio, oh, yeah. and then he had a little platform little where he platform could put his snacks, and he'd sit up there. But at least he didn't have his little hot house where he fall asleep. <laughs> It's a beautiful view up there. I haven't been up there in like four years. It's it takes the wind out of you. <laughs> Where's you out coming up? And it's a bit scary, but uh, it's worth it. Did you guys see the gnome home? Gnome home. <laughs> you guys, did you go up to the treehouse? I had this tree, it's right on the corner of my property, and it's just got the most beautiful flowing branches. You see this one, it goes on for 25 feet. Yeah. When I was laid off from Boeing, this was the first thing that I did, a childhood dream. I was gonna make this the staircase right here. Yeah. Would've been perfect. So it's 42 feet up from the ground, depending where you're standing, could be as much as 50. <laughs> It's a bizarre world we're living in now. And I think the younger generation, they miss the Boy Scouts, the, you know, going out and surviving kind of thing. Whew. Modern society now is changed. Everything now is engineered to not last very long. It didn't used to be. So it's really leaving us not with much to do than to just buy stuff and throw it away. But you found a way back in to use your hands. So. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm flashing back what my dad taught me. To make things with your hands, it's okay. And it's fun. And yeah. it's, a, it's a satisfying. Always playing around with what you can do with a sheet of coroplast. This last one I made is a car top carrier. So you just run a strap here to here, here to here, and around the top part of your door sill. But for the most part, this is just one sheet. Again, folded similar to my boat, coroplast zip ties and two straps, and you have a little carrier. You're going about 65 miles an hour. I don't hear it falling off the car, so I'm gonna slow her down. Let's take a look at it. I seem to be wanting to rain, so I'm trying to car wash death. Alright, let's see. It's pretty dry. So not too bad for one sheet of uh, fluted plastic. Just me again, playing around, seeing what the possibilities are of this fantastic material. Stoves, wood structures, cars, push cars, cars, cars. A little bit of everything. A little know. bit of it's just whatever like, just comes. Yeah, it just, just comes to hand. I've been doing this since I was eight years old. Just, just sketching, and coming up with ideas. Um, it's just something that I do. Push card ideas. When I was younger, I would draw a picture every day of an idea. I did this for about 35 years. Well, there's the drawing for the uh, green one. Oh yeah. And there's the layout for the sheets. I love small shelters like an 8x8 or 6x7 where you just have a bed, desk, stove and a place to sit on the porch. I retired just this year. The biggest reason why I quit was in the 25 years I was there and 10 years of being a drywall finisher I've overused my joints quite a bit and I don't want to keep aggravating that. You've been doing all this while working? Yes. So you're working a full-time job? Yes. Are you making something new? Uh, no. No. Actually, I'm tearing things apart. Tore apart my uh, homeless spare room shelter. Because yeah. i got to move, right? i got to tear some of these guys apart, so. And this is actually the shelter. <laughs> this is it. Four sheets chopped up, 
And it's beautiful because the coroplast is polypropylene, it's recyclable. Ooh. Yeah, a lot of cutting. Wow. But those are all campaign signs on that particular shelter. Yeah. This is all the wood. This is everything it took to build it. I didn't realize it took so much wood, but all this came from like, uh, to be honest, I tore down a few campaign signs. So you, after campaign, you'll go around looking for signs? Yeah, I will. I'll wait a while until I know they're obviously abandoned, and then I'll, for sure, I'll grab them. So all I had to get was the screws, plexiglass. Yeah. In Oso, we had the landslide that killed about 42 people. That was about 20 miles away. So this was an idea of how they could get to people if there's nothing but mud and you can't step on it. A helium balloon that kind of gets you up and you can get around and maybe rescue somebody. Mary and I thought of that one. Folding glasses. Wow. It used to be that the ideas came quick and I had just a ton of ideas. I was trying to help Mary's friend uh, make a, a dog wheelchair. Oh, wow. Didn't work. <laughs> An idea for making tape. And now I've beat those ideas into the ground after all these years. And uh, maybe there's a finite amount of ideas, you know. I'm kind of running out. So I'm thinking now I'll start going through my old drawing books and maybe I'll see something that'll inspire me and go, what about that 25 year ago drawing? There's a uh, bicycle camper that's just a little mini, mini home, kind of like a church. Another mini home. Hello? Yeah. A few critters are in there. Doghouse. Let's see. I think it's two sheets. I sell plans for this and, you know, for dogs that aren't into chewing things up. <laughs> Doghouse. Introduction to coroplast and playing with it. I got a little ventilation thing here. Flap. Yeah. Doghouse. So you just want people to, to learn to, to play with it. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Like everyone should be able to tinker a bit or, or to make things. Yeah. Sure.